Hello, and welcome to episode two of In Nature. Uh, In Nature is a podcast where I take you along with me on my nature walks, and I talk about the things that I see and hear in nature. My name is Monica. I am a student wildlife ecologist, and I live in Bangor, Maine. And um, tonight, actually, you may notice it is a nighttime nature walk. Um, This episode is focused on Big Night, which is an amphibian monitoring project that is a citizen science project that I am volunteering for for the entire month of April. So on the nights where it's a little bit rainy, which you might actually be able to hear the rain on the roof of my car. Um, Don't worry, I am parked. I'm not doing this while driving. Um, (laughs) um, So you may be able to hear the rain um, on rainy nights in April. Uh, amphibians move from their hibernation spots to vernal pools and a lot of the time that it requires them to cross roads which means there are lots of cars in the way of them getting to their vernal pool where they can go and find uh, that special someone and um, make little salamander and frog babies so <laughs> Um, in an effort to help them get across the road and to sort of give us an idea of how many amphibians we see and in Maine um, on the move at this time there is a citizen science project it is um, there is a little bit of training and um, but it's not very long Um, but you get to learn how to identify amphibian species so I am volunteering. I have two sites pretty close to where I live in Bangor, Maine, and um, hopefully tonight we'll see quite a lot of amphibians because it is the first night that it's really warm in Bangor. Um, It is a balmy 52 degrees Fahrenheit tonight, and it is 100% cloud cover. We are absolutely covered in clouds and rain. So the water, the road is very wet which means that the amphibians are very likely to be on the move. It is just after sunset, um, probably about 30 minutes after sunset right now. And I will be walking around with a flashlight and I have this high visibility vest, which is very important for after dark, especially because the speed limit on this road, I believe is about 40 miles per hour. Now, part of this project is that we don't redirect traffic or stop traffic for our safety and the car safety. Um, We are just trying to get counts of how many amphibians we see and uh, make note of any like egg masses or anything we see in a vernal pool. Now, all of the, well, not all of them, but a lot of the sites are determined by um, GIS software. So um, geographic imaging system, I believe is what GIS stands for. Um, (laughs) So a lot of these sites are determined by GIS software and um, So there is a vernal pool on this road, and I will give you a little bit of a shot of that when we get there, if my camera can focus in the dark. I've got the lights on in my car right now, but, um, and I'll have a flashlight, of course, but hopefully I'll get, be able to get any shots of anything at all to share. So, um, why don't we get out and we will, uh, go on our walk in the rain. I don't know if you can hear it but I can hear what I assume are frogs. You can probably hear the wind pretty well, but they're getting more talkative. I haven't seen any amphibians on the actual road yet, but I have seen or heard rather evidence of frogs. So that's pretty exciting, All right, I would say. I'm back. Um, you may notice it's a little bit lighter outside. I decided to record the end of this video during the daytime, so it was a little bit easier for you to see what I'm talking about, what I'm go- what I'm going on about. Um, <laughs> and also, I didn't really want to talk over the rain anymore. So, um, so I don't have any footage of any amphibians to share this this time. It's unfortunate. Um, It took me a little while to sort of reframe it in my head so that we're getting, I'm sharing important information with you, I guess. Um, And so that I could come to terms with the fact that I didn't get to see any, any amphibians this year. I was really, really excited because I haven't seen a salamander since I was a kid. I've seen frogs, but I haven't seen a salamander since I was a kid. And I was really excited to see them this year. So I didn't get to, um, but that's not, That's not the end of the world. 
<laughs> um, so I figured I would tell you a little bit about what a vernal pool is, why it's important, and sort of what are the like classifying factors for it to be a legal um, vernal pool. So a vernal pool is a naturally occurring temporary semi-permanent temporary to semi-permanent pool um, that occurs in shallow depressions in forested landscapes. They provide a primary breeding habitat for wood frogs, blue spotted and spotted salamanders, and fairy shrimp. Um, they also provide a habitat for um, other wildlife, including a bunch of different endangered species and threatened species as well. So that's kind of a general definition. That's what the government government bodies or the, the regulatory agencies use in Maine to define a vernal pool. Um, and that gets sort of a protected status because it is home to those um, endangered species. Um, so, but there's a number of different types of wetlands in Maine. Um, so vernal pools are the only ones that are not defined by the vegetation that you can find in them. So most wetlands in Maine are uh, like bogs. They have specific vegetation that you can only find in bogs, and you're not going to find them in any other type of wetland. So vernal pools are defined by what breeds there rather than by what vegetation exists. They're also not, they can't be home to permanent fish populations. So fish can't um, live there, breed there, eat there, spend their whole lives there. Um, because what makes a vernal pool a vernal pool is something that is part of that definition. It says uh, temporary to semi-permanent. So that means that they get filled with snow melt and rising water tables and um, in the spring. And most of them are completely bone dry by the end of summer. Um, the other thing, some of them do still retain a little bit of water, but not very much. Um, so that's one of the things, if it had a permanent fish population, those fish would die at the end of summer. Um, but the other thing that classifies a vernal pool is that they um, cannot be man-made. They have to be naturally occurring. Um, so that those are those are some sort of criteria for it to be a vernal pool. And they're important because of those animals that breed there. If there are fish present in the water, the salamanders and frog eggs would get eaten. So they can't actually breed in those locations because their eggs would get predated. Um, and they just wouldn't, they wouldn't have any more of more babies and therefore they would go extinct. Um, and that actually could be one of the reasons why my sites in Bangor didn't produce any data. So, so I did see some fish in the pond that was right next to the vernal pool I was supposed to be monitoring. Um, and really, I was supposed to be monitoring the road to make sure that the amphibians could get across. But yeah, so I couldn't actually see any amphibians. And that may be one of the reasons why. The other reason may just be that they didn't hibernate on the other side of the road. So the area I was monitoring was on one side of the road, a sort of residential neighborhood um, with really well manicured lawns. And it was like a, it's like, it's not really densely packed, but it still is residential. So maybe they just didn't go to that side of the road to hibernate for the winter. Who knows? But I do know that finding no data is just as good as finding a lot of data. So <laughs> basically, the people who are organizing this research want data that is useful for um, generating, basically generating um, general, uh, not statistics, but they want to know where the where the frogs and amphibians are and where they're moving to and how many we have. Um, and knowing that these sites didn't produ produce any data, um, even after about, I think it was about three hours total that I monitored these two sites. Um, so over the course of the entirety of May, or I'm sorry, of, of April. Um, and so not having data 
may lead them to conclude they don't need to monitor these two sites anymore because the amphibians aren't crossing that road. Um, they don't really need help um, getting getting to their breeding grounds. So, so they may take this part off of their rotation, um, which is helpful because then they can concentrate more volunteers in the places that actually need to be monitored rather than spending that volunteer time not finding anything. Um, it may also tell them that they don't need to monitor it because there isn't any activity. So it's just one of those, one of those things. So you can go out with every intention of finding data and recording data, um, in research and you can find nothing. Um, and that is really helpful information as well. So that's how I had to reframe it because I was a little disappointed about not finding any frogs. So <laughs> that is just about all I have uh, for you today. I hope you have a wonderful, a wonderful time exploring nature. And um, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to comment or send me an email. It's in nature podcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see more of my videos, go ahead and like and subscribe and I will see you very soon in my next video, we are going to explore Harundo Wildlife Refuge in Old Town, which is one of my very favorite places to go. So um, I hope you have a lovely time exploring nature in the meantime. Thank you so much for watching. Bye!